Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's nice to be presenting to you this afternoon. Um, if you're interested in the fashion textiles or following a creative degree, hopefully you'll be interested by the presentation. So I'm going to talk first. Uh, I'm Neil Bottle. I'm the programme director for fashion textiles at UCA. And then I'm going to pass over to um, one of my fantastic alumni, Elizabeth Wibley, but I'll, I'll introduce her in a minute. So what I wanted to do really was um, kind of give you a snapshot of what I've been doing. Um, I've been working for um, 30 years actually in the creative industries, which um, hardly seems possible actually. And uh, for many years I've worked um, for my own um, company producing fashion textiles products, designs and products. And then I moved into education. And there's been an overlap between education and creativity all the way through. So um, I'll kick start. The, the slide you can see now is um, an image of my website. Uh, this has just been sort of relaunched. I had a big research project, which I'll talk to you about. And so this is a sort of home page that you can see. And it's trying really to tell that story of the sort of hand and the digital working together. So the sort of craft processes and also the sort of digital work that I, I've developed more recently. So to talk about my creative beginnings, I studied um, fashion textiles at university. So you can see a picture of me here very, very soon after I left university. Um, I did a three year degree um, in, in fashion textiles. And in those days, there was no digital. So all of my time was spent learning about screen printing, and dye chemistry and working with fabrics and, and sort of making um, fashion product as well, sort of sewing and making things. So it was a really, really interesting course. So um, this image you can see was a professional um, photo shoot done by a magazine in the UK called Country Living Magazine. Um, after my degree show, I was lucky to, I, win, I won a couple of competitions. I won a competition called the New Designers Prize and it was, um, uh, I think it, the price was about a thousand pounds, which probably would be about five or six thousand pounds today, I guess. Um, and that helped me to get started in my business. And um, I also applied for, it was like um, a, an award. There was a, a business opportunity um, called the Crafts Council, this body, and they were handing out um, grants for makers. So I applied for this grant and um, that was quite a lot of money. I think it was about £10,000, which in today's money is probably about 30, 30 to £40,000. So it was quite a lot of money. One of the first pieces of equipment that I bought was the print table that you can see in this image. So it was a 10 metre long table. Um, and that's why I set up my studio and I started to buy equipment and develop um, different products. So there was a lot of screen printing and hand painting as well. Um, the kind of work that I was doing was sort of washes of colour with very fine detailed screen printing on top. I did quite a lot of exhibitions and I took my work around to galleries and I basically, I think it was a combination of, um, I think sometimes in life you need a little bit of luck and I think I was in the right place at the right time. And so I was making work that was, sort of there was a market for at the time and so um, I think that was that was really important so people were interested in it and so I really started to, um, to make the most of every opportunity so I would be um, you know if there was an exhibition I'll say yeah I can do that if there was a magazine to send off some photos to I would do that um, I would also take my work around to all of the people that had left business cards at exhibitions so I started to develop a a mailing list of clients that I was working um, for, as well as a list of clients that I wanted to work for, um, as well as the ones that approached me, there were people that I approached as well. So this piece here, you can see it's um, hand painted, it's screen printed and um, using acid dyes on silk and then also using um, gold um, pigments as well. And this piece was acquired by the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York, which is really exciting. It was um, it was through a sort of mutual contact. I'd done some work for another company and they recommended me to do this piece. So that's in the permanent collection, which is kind of kept forever, which is really, really exciting. Once I'd done a few things like this, I started to um, 
be approached to do other commissions and also uh, my network of contacts started to extend so these were four really really large textile pieces that I did printed on silk and the photos are a bit dark this is pre-digital so it's quite a long time ago and these were hung going down the staircase at Nortel. Nortel was one of the first companies to develop mobile phones um, sort of over 20 years ago. So it was a really exciting project to do. Um, I had a client who, what I did, I balanced doing work for big stores, department stores and exporting work. I balanced that with smaller galleries and shops that were local. So I always had that feeling that I might be dropped by one of the big stores. They might want me then and then not want me the next year. So I was trying to balance the business of lots and lots of different types of work. Some of it was fashion, some of it was interiors. So I think it was a case of sort of trying to um, get a really careful balance. This was a customer of mine who happened to go into a gallery and he saw the pieces that I was doing. And I had this fantastic commission to do 13 really large pieces for um, a banker in Abu Dhabi, which is really exciting. And um, this piece is about, I'd say, what, 140 centimetres wide and about 250 centimetres high. So it's quite big, actually. And there's a lot of screens. Every single image here you can see is on a separate screen and then all the colours are hand painted in. So it really was quite complicated. Um, I was approached to do some pieces for the Royal Academy um, of Arts in London, the Burlington House Collection, and I did a range of scarves for them. So you can see the sort of hand drawings combined with layers of colour in sort of very rich um, upmarket, sort of expensive looking colours. And that was the sort of niche that I, I wanted to get into, doing sort of, you know, expensive product, high end product for um, a sort of top end of the market. Um, one of the best clients I ever worked for was the Guggenheim in New York, actually. And uh, this was a postcard that they had made. This is probably about 1995 or six or something right around that time. And um, I did a range of um, garments, scarves, ties, waistcoats, and then cushions as well. So it really, really was um, a fantastic project, actually. And um, it's it was something that um, they reordered again and again. So it became a really, really good um, project to do. And here's a picture of the, the Guggenheim and then some of the, some of the items being packed up in my studio. Um, another client I worked for was really, really fantastic is um, Liberty in London, Liberty London. And I worked for them for about, I would say about a 10 year period all through the nineties into the millennium. And um, this window, this image on the right is the, the shop window of Liberty in Carnaby Street. It's the windows that look out onto Carnaby Street. And that was quite, quite often occupied, occupied with my work. So that was really fantastic. Um, Liberty opened quite a lot of doors to other projects and also selling my work to other customers because it's a really big name in the UK. Um, it, it's really a sort of huge brand. And so, they, I think people begin, began to trust the products. Once they'd seen it in Liberties, they sort of um, were much happier to pay um, a, a premium price for the products, maybe buying it directly from me or buying it from other, other customers as well, uh, other outlets as well. So that was really exciting. Um, magazine Press at the time, Homes and Gardens, Tatler Magazine, um, Elle Magazine, Shopfront was the Telegraph um, Sunday um, weekend paper magazine so that's really exciting um I did a lot of work with Neiman Marcus in the USA I worked for the Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in London um this is a really fantastic project um I actually was really lucky I managed to go and see the Globe before it was built so it was a project about the the funding the building and the creation I I was really lucky I got to work with the architect's drawing, some of the handwriting of Sam Wanamaker. He was the original trustee of the Shakespeare's Globe. He raised a lot of money to build it. So it was sort of working with archive documents and the theme for each season would change with the, the place. So it might be Macbeth or Romeo and Juliet, whatever play was being shown that year, I would do um, product based on that. And it was really, really exciting. And that went on all, 
probably for about 15 years, I did all the textiles at Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. It was, it was a lot of product and a lot of money, which was great. Um, I worked through an agency. So really, I was working, doing exhibitions and shows, trade fairs, selling work. I was working through retail events where I would sell work direct to the customers and learn what customers like, what colours would work, how the designs should be formatted. And then I also worked through um, agencies. And one of the agencies I worked through had a number of amazing clients. And one of them was Joyce Stores. Joyce Stores are mainly in um, Hong Kong, Taipei and Taiwan. And this is my first experience of exporting to the Far East. And I don't know whether anyone recognizes this really beautiful woman on the front of the magazine. This magazine's called Joyce and it's the magazine that is issued, um, I think it's twice a year with the store. You get a free copy of the magazine in the store. And that is actually one of the very first, she's one of the top five supermodels in the world. It's Linda Evangelista. She's one of those um, amazing um, 90s supermodels. So it's really exciting to be in a magazine with her on the front cover. Um, you can see here a written piece about my work. And, you know, there was a photo shoot with models wearing different, um, different products that I'd made. Um, this is a collection of cushions. This was printed on velvet. It was hand painted and screen printed on velvet, which is a bit of a crazy thing to do because uh, velvet takes a very long time to dry and it's really difficult to work with. But we did this collection, I had a lot of gold. It was very sort of lush and expensive looking. And um, this is a collection I did for um, Harrods. So this is the Egyptian escalator in Harrods where the work was shown. So that was really, really exciting. And at one point I was in um, homeware department, menswear department and the women's wear department at Harrods, which is really exciting. Um, several years into running the business, I was approached by the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and they wanted to acquire some of my pieces. They they have a collection of textiles which goes back to, um, you know, Tutankhamun's shroud from the Egyptian uh, days of the Egyptian pharaohs, and they collect work, you know, through the 1960s up until um, the present day. So they, they've got, um, I think, they've got about 13 pieces in their collection, which is really exciting. So in theory, anyone around the world could book an appointment and go and see, go and see them. Um, this is another piece I made for them in um, 2007, this piece. Okay, what I want to talk to you about is my journey from analog, doing things by hand, screen printing, into digital. And then that also takes me on my journey into um, University for the Creative Arts, how I started to work for them and how I developed the um, printed, um, printed fashion textiles course. So... Uh, I was around the millennium, we're sort of talking about 2002, 2003, I was approached by the British Museum, um, it's a fabulous museum in London, it's absolutely beautiful, and they wanted me to do a collection for them, and I did this collection, which you can see, um, hand painted and screen printed, and I'd started doing some teaching as well at UCA, and I was getting really, really busy, and they said, really, it would be a great idea if you stop doing them by hand and make them did, you know, print them digitally. So I said, great idea, let's do some digital printing. There's only one problem. And they said to me, what is, what is the problem? And I said, I don't know how to do it. I don't know anything about digital design. So they were amazing, actually. They said, I'll give you three months, go away and learn how to do it. So I had three months, like a, it was like a sort of um, mission, really. It was like a brief to go away and learn how to do it. So I, went off, I learned Photoshop, I learned how to design digitally and to make them digitally. And then I came back with some, some more designs which went really well. Um, so around um, 2000 and uh, actually this is, yeah, 2009, just before 2009, I had an opportunity to go live in the UAE. I actually lived in Sharjah, which is near Dubai. Um, and I was there for about six, seven months. And I was working with the um, University of Georgia to develop um, a fashion textiles course that incorporated digital technology. So I really began to get into the digital side of designing. And then when I came back in 2009, um, mental note, never come back from the Middle East 
to the UK in January because you come from beautiful sunshine to the UK in January, which is very dark and very, very wet. So I should have come back in the summer. Anyway, um, I applied to UCA for a research grant and I had an exhibition, which you can see here. This is the um, card that promoted the exhibition in 2009. So um, we also started, I started the um, BA Fashion Textiles. This is about 13 years ago. So we're galloping through time and um, it was, it's a three-year degree, which we started at UCA, and it, it very much echoed, I suppose, the things that I'd learned in my practice about um, screen printing, dyeing fabric, the craft of making product, making garments, making other product, and then also combining that with the latest cutting-edge digital technology. So we've got amazing digital printers, we've got dye sublimation, so everything we have there. It's such an amazing um, facility, actually. Um, we quite often have research projects going on. And one of the first ones we did, this is around 2013, 14, we did a research project called Lace Effects. And it was a, a project with um, various different partners in France and Belgium and, and the UK. So this was a piece that I made to be shown at the Calais Lace Museum, which is a really beautiful museum in France. And it was a um, it was a digital textile piece um, printed onto a garment which was inspired by one of their archive patterns from their fantastic collection of, of garments. Um, following that, I was asked to do um, an exhibition at Contemporary Applied Art in London, and I actually did a book really which showed the whole process. This exhibition was about uh, people who had adopted digital design or digital process in the practice. So. Yeah, when, when we set up the course in 2009, digital textiles is relatively new. So I guess I would say I was an early adopter of digital design. Um, one of the earlier digital pieces that I did, so this is um, drawings and paintings that are scanned and then um, imported into Photoshop and then sort of manipulated. This was a scarf that I designed for the v &A. So I was back at the Victorian Albert Museum and they've got this beautiful shop with these big glass panels. So you can see the pieces inside. Outside, the, on the other side of this um, slide, you can see the outside of the museum. It really is a beautiful place. If you get to come to London, it's a really lovely place to go. Um, I also did um, a scarf design for Turner Contemporary Margate, a beautiful, art gallery that's about 20 minutes walk from where I live. So I'm really lucky to live near there. Moving forward, I did um, a piece. This is an exhibition called Encountering Digital, and it was a sort of multi-layered piece working with an upholstery company to make a piece of furniture. Um, they make furniture in a very traditional way, actually with you know, wooden frames and the horse there and the calico and the fabric, really, really exciting. And they've never worked with anyone using digital fabric. So I had to learn how to do the pattern matching and everything. So that was really, really exciting. And it's the kind of project that I like doing. I guess around this time we'd start, I developed the MA printed textiles at UCA. So I was running the BA, which was going from strength to strength. And up to sort of 35 to 40 students per year and then we had the MA um, printed text that started about six or seven years ago and then more recently we've launched the um, MA digital fashion which is a really fantastic program looking totally at designing and creating things in the virtual world so that's a really exciting addition so what do I do now and how does it work so I I never thought I would end up um, teaching students and running a degree course. And I think that's the exciting thing about um, working in creative industries is you don't know which direction your, your job will take you. You can end up you know, designing a collection or working for yourself, then you can end up working for somewhere, somewhere else as well. And um, one of the exciting things working for UCA has been traveling. I've done a lot of international travel, I've been to, I've done 21 long haul trips to India, China and the Middle East, um, uh, meeting students, recruiting students, um, developing relationships for UCA. So the traveling has been absolutely amazing, as well as 
meeting lots of lots of new people. So I don't supply department stores. I haven't got this big production line going anymore. All of that's gone. And really, I balance my teaching time with research. So my work's moved more into sort of research area. The research sort of keep it really simple. It's the last five minutes of the presentation. My research is really looking at how digital technology can work with craft processes. My background is in craft and hand processes. And then, you know, I've been working, I've been working 30 years. So I've probably spent 10 years working analog and 20 years working digitally. So I guess it's more digital actually, but I think my early roots were in analog. So that's where my heart is really. And then related to that, I'm looking at how digital technology can change our behavior. How can digital technology change our behavior and how can technology change the creative process? So we all know that around 10 years ago, the smartphone, you know, it's equipped, it's like a small computer basically. And we know um, that has completely changed our behavior. It's changed the way that we take photographs because everybody pouts into a selfie. That ultimately has changed the way that people want to appear in images. It's changed the way they smile. People are even injecting chemicals into their lips to make them bigger, to look like the selfie pal. So it's ended up not only shaping our behavior, but shaping our physical being. Um, this uh, changed the game also with photography. So uh, we have a very different relationship with photography now. And, you know, there was a, a couple in India who fell to their deaths taking a selfie of themselves. They were so busy taking the selfie that they actually sort of staggered over the edge of a cliff to their deaths. Pretty dramatic stuff. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to spend my research project looking at people that had done crazy things. But what I did do was start to reflect on my creative process over 30 years. What could I take? from the things that I've learned. And by, to cut a long story short, through chances of fate and um, I suppose coincidence, I ended up living in an apartment that my, grand my grandparents had lived in. And I visited them many, many times in this apartment when I was a child. And I was staying there temporarily while I was moving into my other house. And um, I came across lots of photographs um, after my grandmother had died she was 96 when she died about eight years ago and there were lots of photos from family memories and the stories but some of them were new some of the photographs I'd never seen before and so they didn't have those memories attached to the stories so you know every Christmas the box of photos would come out and so the photograph that I'm holding here you can see in my hand is probably taken in about 1905, 1906, and it's a picture of my um, grandfather when he was a little boy holding that teddy. Uh, it's a very sorrowful little picture because he looks so cute. And, you know, the photograph itself is this rather strange object. I mean, the idea of a photograph as an object even now seems quite strange because often it's a, a number of megabytes. It's a data, it's a data you know, it's a piece of data that we can send by email or text. We can upload it on Instagram. But this photo is something different. This is the only picture in the whole world that exists of my grandfather at that time in his life. The next photo is probably when he's about 25, when he went into the forces. So that struck a chord with me. And I was thinking about my own son, who's 25 now. And he has grown up through the digital revolution and thinking about the thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs that we have of him as a little boy compared with the one precious object, this photograph. You can see here that the edges are a bit, I think it looks like a mouse has eaten some of the corner. So not only is it rare, it's only one in existence, but also it's got this rather beautiful quality of it. It's it's, it shows the passage of time. It shows the number of times it's been looked at and held and it's a bit dirty, but it's well loved. It's like a favorite teddy bear that is really well loved, but rather grubby. So as we move on, I, I started to think about 
our own relationship with photographs and how it's become a means of communication. I think we use photography to say, here I am, this is what I'm doing, check this out, look at me, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever. And we don't use it to print out those photographs to keep the long-term memory. It's become a sort of short-term memory bank, which I think is really interesting. So this inspired this piece of work that I did. This is about one and a half meters by two and a half meters. It's a very large um, digital design printed on fabric as a wall piece. And the main, the star of this piece is this beautiful photograph of my grandmother when she was about, I think she's about 21 in this picture. And she always looked like a film star. I mean, she was an incredibly beautiful woman. And that's a picture of my mother there as a little girl. So she's about 18 months old. And my mother's 83 now. So it's rather wonderful to look back at this picture. Many, many people in many, many different cultures have photographs from this time that would echo this look of somebody with their hair done in that certain style of the 1930s. And 1938, I think this picture was taken. So it's that sort of curly hair from the 30s. She would have been dressed in her best clothes. She would have gone to the photographic studio and had this image um, taken. People didn't have their own cameras. It was too expensive in those days. So we can weave into this photograph an elaborate story of the time. It's very much of its time. All the other images that you can see collaged into this piece relate to the location where the photograph was found. This, I don't know whether you can see my cursor. If you look at the top right hand corner, there's a, two windows in a building. And that's the view you can see from the apartment where my grandmother lived. And she would be one of those people that would be going out dancing on a Saturday night. Saturday morning, she'd be cutting out a dress on the floor, get the sewing machine out, and she'd make a dress to go out, which was very, very creative. And so I think that's where I got my love of fashion textiles. So you could see this sort of very complex story emerging that was prompted from that, from that image. All the other photos that you can see on, on, in the detailed shot here are actually, you know, a sort of life captured in analog photography. Some of them are from the 1970s with that fabulous Polaroid camera. Um, none of them are digital images. They're all sort of analog images. So I wanted to record those uh, as best I could. So I think um, this shot, you can see the sort of elaborate um, layers of Photoshop. I often work with sort of 100 or more layers or building up these really complicated um, collages. Um, digital printing is not easy. If you're trying to get the exact shade of red that you want, you've got to test it at least two or three times to get the right color. So there's a lot of profiling. There's a lot of sampling and testing to get exactly what you want. So what is wonderful about the digital, the, the print, when you get the print back from the factory, you roll it out on the floor and you cut it out. So that's really, really exciting moment um, that you can actually start working with the fabric. And I love that. I've, I've loved sort of having the product back and working with it. And that's something I always like doing. I don't like just designing digitally. I want to work with the fabric and, and see the product as well. So this was the final show, All That Remains. This was at, uh, it was called All That Remains 30 Years in the Making, and it was showcased at four locations. Um, one was in North Wales, one in London, one in, um, and the Rochester Art Gallery, sorry, three locations. Oh, yeah, um, the Rochester Art Gallery in Rochester and then at, um, Turner Contemporary in Margate. So um, this is a, a, a sort of a snapshot of the exhibition. You can see all the sort of wall pieces here. And also in this glass case, there were a number of artifacts that had been found in the property where my grandparents lived. So it was a kind of a nice link to those pieces to have the story of the objects themselves. Um, so you can see a close up of some of the pieces. There were about 13 sort of key pieces there. This one on the left makes quite deliberate reference to Instagram and Instagram bubbles and the way that we use photography now. I wanted to sort of play on that idea of something very, very historical with something very contemporary. Scarves and cushions and wearable products there in the gallery. Oops, sorry. This is a close up of one of the pieces. You can see that's all hand painted washes with lots of sort of intricate detail. That's something I've done all my life. 
I can't do minimal. I have tried to do minimal, but it just doesn't work with me. It just keeps piling in. So, you know, do what you love is what I say. You have to do that. Um, and my latest piece of work is um, it's this piece of work, um, which was done um, uh, just before uh, last year. And this was a commission for the Worshipful Company of Dyers. And I was commissioned to do two three metre long panels that celebrate the 500th year of the Worshipful Company of Dyers. So it was a really lovely commission. The first panel was about the history of natural dyes. So you can see a, a close up here of Henry VIII wearing a beautiful doublet dyed in beautiful cochineal red with emblazoned on there. I've put one of the galleons that he would have had in his fleet that would have gone all around the world to discover dyes and fabrics and all that kind of thing. So there was a, a story woven in there. On the right hand side, you can see a snapshot of the piece that was to um, commemorate the history of synthetic dyes. And this is a picture of William Perkins, and he's a chemist who discovered the, the chemical Movine. Um, and it was one of the first chemical dyes, purple, which is really exciting. So that's what it looked like. It was, it was sort of three metres. Altogether, it was about six metres long. So that was a really fantastic commission that I did. Um, these are the pieces themselves. So you can see the whole sort of story of the different chemistries and... If you look at the top left, you've got the roots of the tree, of the madder tree, which gives you a lovely reddy brown colour. There are indigo leaves, there's a Tyrian purple shell, etc., etc., etc. So there was a kind of story woven, woven through that. Um, and the most recent thing I've done, just to finish up on, is um, this is one of the pieces from All That Remains that were shown at Turner Contemporary. So that's where we are really. I balance these sort of research projects that I do, creative research projects, always trying to push myself to do something different and new with the courses that I run at UCA. So that, that creates a busy life, I can tell you. Um, but, you know, I've enjoyed being busy. I've had 30 years working flat out really, and um, it's all been really um, interesting and um, taken me in many different sort of directions. So, that is 34 minutes, so I'm almost sticking to half an hour. Just before I hand you over to Elizabeth, I just wondered if there might be any questions that um, anybody wants to ask me about. It could be about the work or it could be about studying uh, undergraduate at UCA or studying a master's, what you, why you might want to do a master's or all those kinds of things, or it, it just studying abroad, really. What is it like to study in the UK? So. Do you think anyone? Yeah, thank you so much, Neil. That was very interesting. We actually have two questions in the chat box. Um, the, so the first one is, um, how long would each collection of yours take to make? Right, okay. That's a really good question, actually. Um, and, and thanks for the positive feedback. That's really kind, thank you. Um, do you know, I think it's quite different. It depends what, what I was doing. So back in the day when I was doing things by hand, sometimes the, the collections and the product would be developed through the making process. So you were kind of designing as you were making things, but I just, you know, for the big stores like Liberty or Harrods, I would have to show my collection to them in say March, February, March to sell for the winter. So they would buy two collections a year. So I would have these fixed points in the year where I would have to get a collection done. Um, I'm sure Elizabeth will relate to this when she comes on, but you know, when you're running a business, you're dealing with the production, the making, dealing with clients, delivering, invoicing, collecting money. I had quite a big studio. There would be a leak in the roof, a piece of equipment would break down. So you're managing people. I was managing staff as well that were working for me. So you end up a little bit crazy. And so the amount of time for designing gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So I found that when I was running my own business, I would literally have about two weeks over the Christmas holiday, December, January, out of two or three weeks designing the collection, and then about four weeks doing the prototypes. And then the whole of the rest of the year was prototype, uh, um, sorry, production. So it was crazy. Now I've got the luxury of being able to take a bit more time. So if I've got a, a research project, I can 
you know, evenings, weekends, I can, I can spend as long as I like. So for example, the pieces that you saw for the worshipful company of dyers, that was about three months, actually. That was a three month, a three month project, but it was quite a high commission. It was quite an expensive commission. Um, so it's difficult to say, but I mean, if I just had to design one scarf, you know, I could probably do it in a couple of days, really. But um, I, I am quite slow. My work has a lot of research in it and I enjoy finding out things about other things. So, I mean, the All That Remains project, for example, was a two year project. So I tend to work on much longer projects now. That's not a very good answer, really, but hopefully it helps. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so we have another question. Um, someone is asking if you would recommend a max master's in textile design if someone is planning on creating their own brand later on. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that's a really, really good question. I, I think I said to you guys that I was one of those people, I just got lucky. I was very driven. I was really, um, I worked very, very hard and I had the right thing at the right time. So I can remember someone um, saying to me that uh, I didn't need to do master's course. They recommended that I should just get on with it straight away. And I'm glad I did go straight into it because I had a few lucky breaks and competition wins and things like that. But I think that was pure. There was an element of luck with those competition wins as well. That when, you know, so looking back on it, I think doing a master's would probably have been a quite, quite good. Uh, generally I think it's good I think for me personally I didn't need it but um, because I was sort of ready to get out there and get on with it and I, the products I had were ready for the market but I think a lot of students that I meet so you know over the last 20 years for example I've met a lot of students who you know they're really talented they've got really good design skills but they don't quite know how they want to approach the market so um you know, they, I, I think in that case, I would really recommend that you do a master's. You, what you'll do is you'll, I mean, you know, there's a whole list of reasons why you might want to do it. So number one might be that you want to improve your skills, for example, or your analog skills. You might want to slightly change discipline. So you might have been doing, say, a BA in fashion or fine art, and then you might want to do a master's in um, printed textiles or fashion so you might want to sort of slightly change route and um, you know learn more skills I think also I've met a lot of students from you know countries I don't know India and China particularly in India students uh, they're, they're it's very competitive in the workplace there are lots of it's a big population so they find if they've got an, a master's from a country particularly like the UK if they've got a qualification from UCA that will enable them to go back and move into a higher position. So a typical scenario in India, for example, would be somebody's been working for one or two years and they're stuck in the same position. So they want to move up and, and improve their skills. Uh, another reason could be, you know, just really get gaining more experience. I think a lot of graduates leave and they start to really switch on in the last six months and yeah, they need a bit more time. So there's that. And then it might be making contacts. So if you were coming from, um, you know, your home country to the UK, you would maybe have industry contacts, you might do an industry project, or something like that. So all of that would be part of your MA project. So you, you could sort of build on those networking skills. Um, for example, we, we deliver projects, you know, we, we talk about social media, we talk about website design. So Whatever course you're doing, if you want to get your work out there, I think it's it's a really good idea to do it. Um, some people like to have like six months or a year out. So they'll do their BA, maybe get some work experience. And then they think, right, now I want to go back and I want to learn this. This is when it gets serious. Um, other students will go straight from BA to MA. It's completely up to you. I actually did, I did a BA and then I did an MA uh, about 20 years later <laughs> so I, I did my BA went straight into the business I started teaching I did an, an MA in digital design because I wanted to proper qualification in digital design which was very new at the time 20 years ago it was very new so I sort of thought right I'll, I'll do this and I really enjoyed it I liked being the student again I liked you know I'd run a company I'd had work here there and everywhere but I really did being a student again, I think that was really exciting. 
Okay, thank you so much. And the last question, and I think it's very interesting. Um, do you really need talent in order to do what you do, or is just uh, this is something that you're gonna learn throughout the coursework or with experience in general? So do, do do you need do you need to be intelligent to, or talented to? Yeah. So do you right. need talent in order to do what you do? Or yeah. I mean. Yeah, I think there's a very, very famous quote from the amazing artist Picasso that said it's it's sort of 98% hard work and 2% talent. So I'm, I'm not sure about that, but I think, um, you know, I think the thing is everybody has got a, a piece of magic in, in their skill set. You know, some people are really good at drawing. Some people are really good with colour. Some people are good at bringing things together. Um, I think for me, my passion, I love fabric. You know, from a small child, I would be making things out of fabric. I loved printed fabric. And so I suppose for me, it's a love of pattern and colour. I think probably colour is, is one of my strongest skills. Um, and there are other things that I, I've found very difficult and I've just had to learn them. You know, learning to be completely fluent in a digital program is quite difficult. I, you know, I've, I've got some students that I, I wouldn't say they're the best at drawing or they're not the most amazing. They didn't get high, high scores in their, you know, their um, exams at school, but they are amazing designers because they, they've applied themselves and they just work really, really hard. You, you have to have a dream to, to do something you want to do. And really it is all about hard work because just being good at something isn't enough uh, I think you have to really have a, a love of it and I think it's very interesting you know if you if you look at the music industry and you'll see people that are um, you know it's it's famous you know famous in five minutes they make a lot of money and then they sort of just don't do it anymore and then you've got those other people that just go on for 20 30 35 years because they're not doing it for the money, they're doing it because they love doing it. And I think that's the difference. So for me, I, I don't have the design now. I have a full-time job at the university. I could just say, right, that's it. I'll do my work and go home, but I love it. So I'm using my own time to keep whatever is there alive. You know, it's, it's a case of doing that. So I think, yeah, I think you do need a bit of talent, but you can, you can work on that. And, and sometimes you don't know what that talent is because you might not have found it yet. And, yeah. some, and sometimes you find that in the workplace, which is important. Yeah, definitely, it makes sense. Um, I think that's it in terms of questions, but if anyone has any more, um, any further questions, they can just type it and it can be visited later. Um, thank hey. you so much, Neil. It was um, very interesting. Oh, thank you. Really. Would, um, would you like me to introduce Elizabeth? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, Elizabeth, are you ready to be introduced? Yes. <laughs> thank you for so, Neil. That was lovely to hear. Oh, oh good. Well, I think you've heard bits of it before, haven't you? Because yeah, but not quite the full rundown, and, and nice to be revisited as well. So I oh, really enjoyed. Thank you, thank you. So I'd like you to introduce you to Elizabeth Wibley. Um, I taught Elizabeth Wibley when she was on the BA Fashion Textiles. Now, how long ago was that? Did you finish about four years ago? Three years ago, oh, not quite. Years. But yeah, I, it's gone so quickly. So. so Elizabeth did that and then she did um, MA Fashion. OK, and then she started her brand. So um, she is absolutely amazing. She has um, she's got the talent, but also she's got that work ethic. And I can remember her on the degree and she was just amazing. She worked so hard. I don't think nothing comes easily, does it, Elizabeth? No, <laughs> no. But what you were saying about um, you know, um, you, you don't have to be the best drawer, but it, as long as you've got this kind of like this spark and this fire inside of you that actually makes you want to work really hard and that's what you're using as your drive, that that's what I found. And, you know, it, I think oh, sometimes it would be easier to get another job where I'd get more money and more job security if I decided to uh, get a job in the industry opposed to having my own brand. But actually the thing that kind of um, wakes me up every single day is knowing that I'm able to do my own brand and do my own design. So you're kind of choosing um it's more fulfilling but it's definitely yeah. driven by hard work and um not everyone's kind of cut out for that but if you are then you like it's so good to run with it and and also you know what better way to get yourself noticed and then you can always go into the industry later on but 
you get one moment when you leave college to start your own thing. And that's exactly what yeah. I wanted to do. And, and that's what you're doing now. So yeah. what's really special about what Elizabeth's doing is it's so new. It's just absolutely, it's for your generation. You know, a lot of stuff I did is a hundred years ago. So it's really nice for you guys to hear it from, from Elizabeth. So I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm actually not in my studio today. I am in my bedroom. Um, I would usually be in my studio working, um, but I have COVID at the moment. So sorry if I sound a bit poorly, um, but I'm generally OK. And I'm going to um, show the slides that I've got for you best I can access um, from my bedroom. So um, I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully this all runs smooth as pos. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna just start with some slides here. Um, just talking about um, yeah, my career. Um, I'm only really a couple of years into my career um, and that transition from studying at UCA and doing my um, BA and my MA there. So the backdrop of this is my final collection. So I was working on this three years ago um, and still work. Um, still find this collection that I did, you know one of the most inspiring things that I've done and it still influences my work today. Um, so a bit of background, um, I live and work in Margate in Kent so that's a seaside town. I feel like a lot of a lot of the tutors at UCA as well we're all kind of like seaside, seaside livers um, which is lovely. I think the, the seaside is such an inspiring place to be so I moved down to Margate nearly two years ago. Uh, and I have a studio space, which is the, the picture of the empty room. So that's what it um, looked like once I'd finished decorating it. It absolutely does not look like that now. Um, I, oh, I've accidentally skipped through the slides. Oh, oh bear with me, everyone. I've gone too far the wrong way. Um, oh, sorry, everyone. I'm just going to go back to the top because I can't seem to. I didn't realise I couldn't go backwards on this slide. Let's go back to here. Sorry about that. Yeah, so that's my, my studio space, which now is very full. There's sewing machines in there, there's loads of fabrics in there. Uh, but when I first got my studio space, that's what it looked like. I painted the floor pink and painted the walls green. Um, so a lot of my um, design aesthetic explores my experience of childhood and girlhood and um, nostalgia from westernized 1960s and 70s. Like Neil does, I like to use a lot of photo montage and collaging. Um, a lot of my work used to be very tactile and hands-on, but I've definitely moved on to a pretty much um, completely digital um, way of working now. I love using Photoshop and Procreate on my iPad, um, but I still really like to keep quite a nice illustrative um, style. Um, I've got a very, very strong colour palette, which defines not only my personal style, but also the style of my brand. Um, had my own business really about the last five or six years. I started off selling on Etsy um, and then moved on to my own website. Um, and in November, 2020, so about a year and a quarter-ish, started my own brand full-time. So that was when I'd finished university. Um, I do some other freelance work as well in between, but generally, you know, my biggest passion, my biggest um, output of time is um, into my brand. So why do I love my creative career? Um, I won't read the whole thing out to you on the side. You can have a read through that while I'm talking or while you're looking at the visuals, but these um, are some early poster work that I did showcasing some of my print designs onto clothes. So this was actually before I started having my own brand um, that is now a limited company. But you can see my vision was um, I'm very driven to make this not commercial in the sense everyone would wear it, but as in it's an affordable pieces and um, wearable pieces of um, including my print designs on them. Um, so I really love to devote my life to feel good, fun items and artwork that create emotions in people. Oh, I want them to feel confident and true to themselves. I want them to find clothing that's really self-expressive and helps them, you know, add some joy to their um, hopefully sustainable, ethical kind of capsule wardrobe. Um, I love drawing and crafting. It's really rewarding. I get to work with lots of really talented people. I get to meet lots of fantastic people in the fashion industry as well. Um, and most of all, my creativity is an outlet to help me to calm and self-expression. And I'm a massive believer in that. So even if you don't do 
creativity as part of your career and as part of your income I still think being creative um, just for your general well-being is so important um, so Elizabeth Ribley which is the name of my brand is a slow ethical local and eco-conscious brand so it's quite a lot of keywords um, but to sum it up basically it goes against the fast fashion kind of uh, narrative that happens in the fashion industry at the moment which is um, a lot of poorly made poorly run you know like with no morals really behind the brands um churning out clothing um every like couple of days or weeks my brand is completely against that and that's not what I stand for in my personal shopping behavior either um I'm a slow fashion brand which means that I'm um last year I actually did three collections and already this year I'm bringing that down to two collections so really slowing down the pace making it much more um, along the traditional spring, summer, autumn, winter um, seasons that fashion generally runs by. Um, it's slow fashion is generally considered more eco-friendly um, because there's just not as much production. Everything I make is also made to order. So there's, you know, there's no over um, overproduction or overconsumption, which means that there's less waste. Um, ethical fashion bar as I can trace and have control of in my supply chain is um, treated and valued individually so at the moment in my brand it's just me and my seamstress so she's also a UCA a University of Creative Arts graduate she graduated a few years before me doing atelier which is uh, like a seamstress and sewing and tailoring course so different skill set to mine which is you know fantastic because we get to collaborate and make sure that we're both using the skill sets that we have to our maximum um, efficiency. So mine is mostly in textile design and styling and um, color and kind of merchandising and brand visuals. And her is very much in um, creating the garments and the um, construction of those garments. Um, so local means that their brand is all locally made. So my studio space, it is all designed. Um, the pattern will be made in there. It will be cut and sewn and packaged and then posted in the local post office. So it's about as locally and small made as it possibly could be. And it's eco-conscious because I, um, as part of the brand I choose and kind of um, weigh up and judge to find a way to make as least harm in the environment as possible, whether that's down to fabric or packaging choices. Um, and I do really believe in educating the consumer and encouraging longevity of the garment and to people to make wise um, decisions when they are shopping. So all of this imagery um, is imagery from my brands over the last kind of year and a half. And some more brand imagery as well. This is the wallpaper that you could see. You can probably, I'm not actually sure if you can see it in the video call, but I think you probably can. Uh, this is a wallpaper design that I did and I have it up. It used to be, this room used to be my studio before I moved studios and now it's my bedroom. So I've got the wallpaper up still. Um, so hopefully these links are gonna work. I'm gonna take you, I'll take you through to my Instagram first. Yeah, there we go. One, two, three. Not working. I don't know why that didn't work. It started for a minute, but anyway, then it went on to another video. Um, but that was a video um, that was just showcasing some of the collection that I did last year. Um, so I did a big production photo shoot. I booked out um, a location. I booked out um, a model and an assistant and a makeup artist and a photographer. So I had a whole team with me and did a really nice big photo shoot. Those images are on my website, so hopefully this link will work um, and we can have a little look through some of the imagery. Um, oh yes, yeah, so it's sliding through now. So this is my um, website. So it showcases different collections, um, kind of summarizes my brand over the last few years. Um, and then you can go into work here and look through my previous collections that I've done. So I'm really at the stage with my brand, you know, I'm kind of doing everything except from the sewing. So as I said, I have my seamstress, but I have to do all of the website, I have to do all the photos, I'm writing up all the descriptions of the items that are for sale, all the packaging, posting, you know, it's such a big responsibility um, doing this job. So it's definitely a work in progress at all times. There's lots of um, parts of the brand that I know that I want to improve in. 
and I'm learning so much along the way. Um, I really found that doing the um, degree that I did really helped solidify my brand style. Um, so there's some little snippets there of my website, which um, hopefully that brand style translates into me as a person, as you've seen me earlier just a minute ago. Um, but also, you know, the slides I'm putting forward, my social media, um, brand identity is probably the most defining part of my brand. And I would really love the idea of my customers taking little snippets of that and reworking it themselves. Um, so there's some snapshots of my social media. So how did I get to my position in the industry that I'm at? So I studied at UCA Rochester for five years and completed three levels of qualification in fashion and arts. So I started off with a foundation in art and design. Then I did my three year degree in fashion textile print at UCA Rochester, graduated in 2019. So literally this time, three years ago, I was making my graduate collection. So I was designing it, sewing it. Neil was my tutor for that. And, you know, we would discuss my collection and, you know, everybody there, Neil included, everyone's really lovely and helpful and encouraging and, you know, getting us to make the right decisions for our graduate collection. Um, and then straight away, um, I did my, I did one year full-time master's in fashion design that I completed in September, 2020. And that's when I pretty much went straight into my brand. So uh, we were in lockdown in the UK at that time. Um, so started, you know, launched my brand from my bedroom in lockdown, my housemate, um, who I also met at university, you know, she was the model for my collection. We literally shot it in my bedroom as well. Um, and I did a selection of internships as well, which you can um, see here and did Graduate Fashion Week, which is the biggest showcase of graduates in the UK and I think potentially Europe as well. Um, and New Designers, which is a, another really huge um, exhibition space and showcase of recent graduates. Um, I've done two, no, I've done three pop-up shops actually. I did two post-pandemic the year that I graduated. And then I did one um, last summer um, in July in my hometown of Margate. Um, so you can see here, even though these are two years apart, the, the kind of like the merchandising and the promotion and the, the color palettes and the, the way that I lay things out of my shop is very consistent. And that consistency carries through from my new designer stand from 2019. So, you know, nearly three years ago to my website. So, you know, I've used that same wallpaper, that same backdrop. The color palettes are the same. The motifs are very similar. Um, my style is, is so important. Um, and I really like the idea of customers being able to really identify my um, store aesthetic. Um, so it's kind of familiar. It helps you build up more of a household name and to become a memorable brand because obviously the fashion industry is extremely competitive. Um, I've done a selection of collaborations. So I've plucked out one with Jade Clark, who is a swimwear designer. She's also from the UK. She's a one woman um, female run her brand. It's also size inclusive and a slow fashion brand. So I designed five different um, print designs for a swimwear collection. And I also last year did a collaboration with Lucy and Yak. Lucy and Yak are a really big, um, probably the largest brand that I would work with in regards to their kind of like scope and how, how um, global their brand is. They are a, um, a sustainable, ethical fashion brand. So I did a really big collection with them. I think it was seven or eight pieces. It's the biggest collaboration they've ever done with a print uh, designer. So that was obviously such an honor and really exciting. So that collaboration is still out now. I've also done, uh, I know we're quite tight for time, so I will whip through this. Um, I also did a window display for Selfridges in London, which was like fantastic opportunity. I was very flattered they asked me to do that. So I created a piece um, when shopping was allowed to happen again. Um, they had an outside shopping space, like middle of the pandemic. So there, um, I just drew directly onto the window with pens. So something I'd never done. I've never even done a piece of work that was bigger than like an A2 piece of paper. And all of a sudden I was drawing on a huge window. So that was, you know, like a really good um, new opportunity and definitely was out of my comfort zone. Um, but, you know, the, the, I like to think that the degree that I did had a lot of good transferable skills, um, which meant that really it was just surface design and this was a new surface I was working on. So it's a really interesting challenge for me. 
Um, this is just a little delve into some of my processes um, while I was actually still at uni. So when I was doing some more hand rendered stuff. So this is the making of a coat, some screen printing, um, some experimenting onto fur. These are some pages from my portfolio. And same with here, primary imagery, collecting my colour palette is such an important part of my uh, brand identity. So, you know, pretty much my whole world revolves around colour, colour matching uh, and finding like visually stimulating imagery. So job linked to this degree, there's a whole list of them there. So whether that's something that you would go into after uh, studying, delve into it while you're studying, maybe these are the kind of people that you'd be collaborating with or hiring or working with. Um, and just to wrap it up, if there's any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. And I know I didn't get to show you the whole link on Instagram. I'm not sure why that didn't work. Um, but if you wanted to look at more of my Instagram or look at my website, it's Elizabeth Wibley shop for my branded one. Okay, let's get back in to the Zoom. Thank you so much. Okay. That was. Um, awesome. I think right. I managed to whip through that just in the nick of time. Um, if there's any questions, please feel free. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions. So someone is asking, uh, what made you realize that you wanted to study design? Um, well, I knew, I think for as long as I can remember as a child, always being extremely into crafts and actually drawing. I'd always be drawing. Um, I wanted to go into teaching when well, before I kind of realized that fashion designers was a real job. Um, you know, I always thought it was a bit of a dream job. And then it wasn't until um, I met either other people that had their own businesses or when I actually went to university, that's when I realized that this is a real job that real people do. And actually there is a lot of uh, job opportunity in design. And that's when I realized I can really do this. Um, but I've always been interested in teaching. Um, but design for me just seemed like the most obvious choice in, in any way that I could get into and I because I love fashion and I love um, clothing I knew that that was the best way for me to get into it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting um, someone is asking also how long did you say it took you to become known since the start and also a follow-up question um, how old were you when you started? Um, did you there was the first question how long does it take to be known? Uh, to become yeah so yeah. yeah, you're more exposed or more visible. So I start, so because I do run a lot of my brand on Instagram, you know, that's the biggest platform really for me to um, advertise my brand as it is such a digital world at the moment. Mm. Um, I started my Instagram about five years ago um, and with my Etsy shop online. Um, so, you know, that was something that you have to kind of work on really quite regularly. So whether that's daily or weekly, um so I'm 24 now um I graduated when I was 21 um and started my brand full-time like made it a limited company when I was 22 I think if I've got that maths right around 22 23 um so I have been doing it you know since I've left education um immediately really mm -hmm. okay interesting and someone's asking is it better to work alone or within a team um, I, when my team is very small, so it is just me and my seamstress, but you know, without her, I wouldn't have my brand to the level that it needs to be because I feel like sometimes I, there's so many things to do that I can't even do everything. So without having her to actually make the clothes, you know, it'd be so difficult for me to run the brand that I would want to. Um, I've had three interns with me, so I've, I've made the team, a uh, team of three before, and that's fantastic. But at the stage that I'm at, I wouldn't be able to have that as a full-time thing um but I think a real a real mix I definitely need days by myself where I can you know really get my head down and focus but then I love the idea of collaborating and um, bouncing around ideas and different skill sets so I think actually a balance of the two is perfect I wouldn't want to be working solely by myself okay I actually have a question um yeah so we hear a lot about minimalism and we have an idea of what that is but what does maximalism mean and how does it translate into fashion Cool, that's such a good question. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I love maximalism. I My brand definitely is like driven by that aesthetic. I've always loved that aesthetic. I love collecting things. I love a pastiche of um, different styles, different textures. 
I love, uh, I guess maximalism to describe it is, is like more is more. So it's about layering up um, as much as possible. And I think I might, have, I might lose wind of where the, what the question was, but just to talk about maximalism in fashion, um, I think a lot of people love the idea of maximalism, but because they are eco-conscious in the way that they consume through fashion, they don't actually want to buy lots and lots of things. So I think maximalism for me is about appreciating and working with the garments that you already have and that you love, but using them to the maximum value. So how can you style them up in five different ways or um, how can you get the most out of that garment and really picking items? Maybe you'd be spending a bit more money or putting a bit more thought into a new garment, but actually you're going to have that for such a long period of your life um, that it becomes, you know, something really special and maybe, um, you know, people that really like maximalist style with choosing to buy things that are really special, really unique. And I think it's actually easy to find these special, unique items, either through finding vintage um, garments or through supporting small fashion brands like mine, where we're making really unique um, fashion pieces from our own, you know, point of view. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I think. Mm -hmm. Definitely interesting. I think there's this um, conception of that people have is that um, if you go minimalist, you are making more conscious uh, decisions and you are uh, being more ethical. But I think, as you said, if you just buy some uh, local brand, ethical brands, also thrifted uh, pieces, you're also being ethical in a way. I don't know if, if you agree or not. No, I do agree with that. And I, I think actually a lot of fast fashion pieces are extremely, you know, rep replicable and um, they're easy to replicate is what I'm trying to say like you know you if you bought like a plain um item you wouldn't be able to tell which shop it was from it could be from any 10 high street shops it's you know there's so much there's such an abundance of these of these garments but actually very special um very special items will have been whether well, we might maybe come from a, a small fashion brand or an independent designer you know they're a lot more exclusive they're a lot more special um and I think then they're more appreciated and they're less likely to be thrown away as well or purchased in a hurry or purchased you know mindlessly mm -hmm. okay very interesting okay. um let's see if we have any other questions um Okay. Um, I think I think that's it. If not, I've got I've got a question for Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah. um, it, I know this is really hard. Could you describe to everyone a typical day? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so typical day for me now. Let's say when I'm not at home having COVID, it would be. Um, I am very lucky because my studio is about half an hour walk, but it's all along the seafront. So I get to walk through Margate, right along the beach. I walk into my studio. My seamstress is already there because she gets there super early, which is fantastic. She gets in at like quarter past eight every morning. I don't usually get in until nine. Um, I usually have a few emails and like a bit of admin to do. I, I you know, set the tasks for her, pack a few orders. Um, don't get to do as much design work um, as I'd want to every single day. That's very much something that I have to set time aside for maybe in like week portions at a time where I'd be like, okay, this whole week I'm going to design. Um, but I think a general kind of day in the life is, um, yeah, it would be planning social media posts, um, packing up orders, ordering fabrics, um, tying up kind of like any loose ends from around the week and then when I'm in these like design um periods of time where I will set aside a whole week to design that would me then be doing researching mood boards um sketches by hand sketches online and then sampling fabrics as well so sending off them in different scales and different colorways etc no two days are really the same though I find they you know days circulate and there, there's patterns in the way that each collection runs but days are never really completely the same um but yeah I generally wrap up work about 6 or 7 p.m um so they are long days but they are good days that's brilliant thanks Elizabeth it's really really good lovely to have an insight on how things are developing and I guess, are, are, you, are you at that stage where you've got a kind of five-year game plan or are you just waiting to see what unfolds and go with it along the way? Um, 
I feel like because I've done such a big collaboration with Lucy and Yak last year, you know, there's no one actually on my horizon. It's not that I'm, you know, not set, not setting my standards high, but because I've had such a big collaboration so early on in my career, I'm not expecting any big collaborations to happen this year or even potentially next year. And because there's a lot of things that I want to improve in my brand that maybe a lot of other people from the outside perspective wouldn't see, it's more of a personal thing. You know, there's a lot of, um, I've got a lot of collections that I want to make. There's a lot of different things I want to branch into. Um, I used to do, be, do um, I used to do jewelry design predominantly, and now I really don't get time to do that. So, you know, that's something that I want to go, make sure that I go back into and spend time with. So mm. I do always have a five-year uh, plan and I do love to manifest and write down what I want to do each year um, but I don't think it's going to be anything um, collaboratively as big it will much more be about um, honing in my business and making sure that it, that's actually perfect or near near to perfect anyway yeah great it, it's important it's it's difficult to juggle everything isn't it and and as you take on more staff, you find that you're having to work hard to find them things to do and make sure they're working yeah. efficiently and it becomes a management be, situation. I would really like to have one more member of staff by the end of this year, because I do think yeah. a team of three is fantastic, like three is the magic number. Like, I think that would be fantastic. Yeah. Just uh, an assistant to help with everything, really. Um, yeah. A good administrator as well. Yeah, I'd love to have someone that does admin because I want to do... You know, I, I never want to get to a point where my brand is so big that I never get to design because I'm just a manager yeah. of a, a creative hub. Like I want to be the designer at the end of the day. So um, that's the most important thing to me, making sure that that happens. Yeah, definitely. I will have to talk afterwards. I can recommend someone. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> I've just got someone I was thinking about. Yeah. Oh, thank well, you. I hope everyone's enjoyed that. Two very, very different perspectives on, on the sort of creative industries. Um, yeah, so, you know, good luck to all you guys, you know, with different applications or whatever you're thinking about. Um, you know, you need a lot of skills, really. I think that's the thing is to focus on building the skills, making sure you've got what you need. And then, you know, with hard work, you can do anything. You can achieve what you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. thank you so much both for joining. It was uh, really interesting and informative. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And as a kind yeah, of... Thank you. Yeah, this is the, the first webinar of the series of the nine webinars we're doing, and we are having the second webinar tomorrow, same time um, as today. But that's it. Thank you again for joining, and thank you for participating. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.